an extra special episode for me personally. Uh, today's guest is Jane Elliott, and in a minute I will let her introduce herself because hearing how she describes herself and her work will be really interesting because there's so many things that I could say as well. <laughs> And how this woman has impacted my life and my work. And I am so grateful uh, to her. And, and words like grateful don't seem to be grateful enough. Uh, so this is a real honor for me to be able to have this conversation on Communicate Like You Give a Damn. And I have some questions. There's things that she needs to say that she needs to share with us. This will be less of a interview that like um in some other episodes you may be familiar with this is more of like what does jane need to tell us what do we need to hear from jane elliott and i do have some questions but we i also was given some questions from you the podcast audience that of you know your requests of what you'd like to ask her as well so i will be i will be sharing those questions with jane as well so let's get started. Jane Elliott, thank you so, so much for being here on Communicate Like You Give a Damn. But I do give a damn. I give it a great <laughs> big damn. This has gone on That's long right. enough now. We shouldn't even be having to talk about this topic now. Do you not realize that the word race, meaning a specific group of people, came out of France in 1580? That recently, that word began to mean a specific group of people. That is not far enough away for us to, we should have stopped this nonsense a long time ago. When I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise in my classroom after, on the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I did it out of sheer ignorance because I was born in 1933. That was the year that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt came to power in their respective countries. And for the next 12 years, for the first 12 years of my life, I heard my father ranting about the horrible things that Adolf Hitler was doing and that our country was letting happen. And he was furious. And, and now I'm going to be 90 years old in two months. And I'm hearing the same kinds of things come out, come out of a man who wants to be returned to the presidency, absolutely repeating what Adolf Hitler said before he became the chancellor of Germany. Before he started the Holocaust, the things that he was saying are now coming out of Donald Trump's mouth. I am angry and I am terrified and I am wondering what in hell happened to education in this country that we haven't told our students so that our future teachers, our future members of the legislature, our future governors will know what is going on when some, some person who wants to be a demagogue runs for the presidency and can and can succeed because of the ignorance of the population of the United States of America. We spend more on education than practically any other nation does. We insist that every child be in school at least from the age of five to the age of 16, but we don't insist that their educators educate them. We don't even insist that educators be educated. Our educators are teaching the same things that I was taught when I was in school and that was what, 85 years ago. We've got to change the curriculum in these schools. We've got to change what educators are taught. We've got to change what they are allowed to teach. And we've got to stop this book burning. We've got to stop this banning of books like those written by Mark Twain, Alice Walker, Dostoevsky. And I'm tired of being banned on college and university campuses because I know that what I have to say is valuable for students in colleges and universities today, because nobody else is saying it. And if they are saying it, they aren't saying it loudly enough, and they aren't saying it strongly enough. And if they do say it, they're in danger of losing their jobs now because of 40% of the Republican Party will follow a monster. Now, somebody's going to say she doesn't even know how to pronounce Republican Party. Oh, yes, I do. Donald Trump knocked the L out of the word Republican. It is now Republican because that's the main thing. That's thing, the thing he thinks of most. He is obsessed with the Republican era, with the pubic area. We have to realize what he has done. We've got to change the now. Now we've got to change the name of the Supreme Court because the people that he has put on the Supreme Court have indicated that the one thing they're worried about is the color of the sperm that are allowed to enter women's abdomens now. If they're, they're ovaries. I'm sorry. 
We have got to realize that you cannot go backward and expect to make history. This is what is happening right now in this country is absolutely unacceptable. It is it will destroy this nation. It will ruin our democracy if we don't now immediately. And I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. I'm not even an independent. I vote because I have to. But but the way it's set up right now, if I were in certain areas in this country, I wouldn't be allowed to vote. And if I were a different skin color, I would know I probably wouldn't be allowed to vote because we have taken such drastic steps backward in the last 20 years. I am, I knew when, when President Eisenhower put the words under God into the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, we were in trouble. And I knew after I realized that for years the words in God we trust had been on our money, I knew that that was a bad thing to do. We are supposed to have separation of church and state in this country. But right now, if you haven't read Anthea Butler's book, White Evangelical Racism, you better get it and read it because it is the most graphic description of what has happened in this country because of the evangelical faith. It is terrifying and people need to be aware of that. Now, I'm not sure that's what you want to hear, but once you've done the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, and you watch the kids who were on the bottom the first day refuse to abuse the ones who were on the top, the neck who were on the top when they when the first on the second day, refuse to abuse those who were on the top the first day. You think, oh my God, maybe that's the answer. Maybe these pale, stale males who are afraid that if people of color become the numerical majority in this country, they'll want to treat us the way we have treated them. If they would realize that that isn't what happens with the exercise. If they would just realize that people who are in the LGBTQ plus society don't want to get even with the rest of us. Women don't want to get even with men. The old want, don't want to get even with the young. We know how it feels to be abused because of ageism, sexism, homophobia, ethnocentrism, anti-Semitism. We know how all those things feel. We know better than to visit that kind of behavior on other people. We know that it will destroy your society. I think it's really important that we level set the main messages that you want to make sure everybody knows. And that's what I was hoping you would share. And, and that is what is on your heart. What I just, what, what's on your mind. And yeah. The, the three, the three that I just said are the three that I want everybody to realize without what we call blacks, there would be no whites. We are all descendants of people from Africa. Get over it folks. We are all one color. We are all shades of brown. There is no white people. There are no white people. There are no black people. There are no yellow people. There are no red people. We are all shades of brown because we all have melanin in our skin. So get over the idea of black and white and stop using those two words to describe people. They came up during the Spanish Inquisition because Torquemada was going to turn everybody Catholic and he was going to kill all those who weren't Christians. And after he had killed almost 2,000 people, somebody said to him, you know, many of the people you just killed were Christians. He realized that you can't tell what a person's religion is by looking at them. So he decided he'd have to find a way to de decide whether somebody deserved to live or die. So he called the lighter skinned people, the lighter skinned brown people, white, because white is the color of goodness and purity. He called the darker skinned black brown people, black because black is the color of savagery and evil. That was in the 14 and 1500s. People, for the love of God, if you are going to use those two terms for the rest of your lives, then you must take on the kinds of means of transportation and communication and dress that they used in the 1400s and 1500s. And I want to see people like you and me coming to work wearing corsets so tight that you can't breathe because your waist can't be more than 18 inches around. And I want to see men wearing knee, knee breeches and shoes with little rosettes on the toes and powdered wigs, because that's the way they dressed when those two words were came up with for the colors of people. If you're gonna talk like the 50, 1400s and 1500s, then live the way they did, travel the way they did, and you'll never have to worry about listening to somebody like me again, because you'll give up things like television and computers and all the things that make our lives comfortable and that make communication easy. But we don't want to do that. We want to continue to use those words, but enjoy 21st century living. It makes no sense. You've got to give up one or the other. And we are so, and as far as I'm concerned, 
It is absolutely essential that we all know that without blacks, there'd be no whites. We're all just faded, black, white, white, black people who faded. Without Jews, there'd be no Christians. The first five books of the Old Testament came out of the Torah, which is the Jewish book of faith. And without women, there'd be no men. You can put two female cells together in a Petri dish, break down the cell wall and come up with another female mammal. You put a bunch of sperm cells in a Petri dish, mix them up and all you get are mixed up sperm. You will not get another living being, but you will with females because we have a special, a special uh, ability that men don't have. We, and then now some man is going to say, well, what about you have to have a man to make a baby? No, you don't. No, you don't. Women can reproduce asexually if they choose to. I don't choose to. I don't. I love men. Oh, God, I love men. We won't talk about that. However, you need to know that <laughs> without somebody like me, there could be nobody like them. We've got to start appreciating women. We've got to start appreciating women. And we've got to start realizing that civilization depends on women. Human life depends on women. Okay. Uh, what else? What, what should I, what, what do you want to know? You want me to answer your questions? <laughs> Yeah, I do have some questions. Um, one okay, related to what question. You, okay, related to what you were just talking about, stopping saying white people, black people. So, what are your uh, what what are the terms that are more accurate and respectful? Totally accurate are, but nobody will want to do them because it's three three syllables. If you don't have enough iron in your blood to keep you healthy, you are called anemic. If you don't have enough melanin, the chemical that gives your skin its color to keep you protected from the rays of the sun, you must be melanemic. Make sense? If you yes. have more melanin, you must be melanaceous, melanaceous, which rhymes with gracious and spacious and efficacious. If you have a lot of melanin, you're melanotic. And that word is in the dictionary and it means having a lot of melanin in your skin to being almost black. But you're not black. We are not black. We are very dark brown. If you're very dark brown, you're melanotic. If you're medium brown, you're melanaceous. If you don't have any much melanin in your skin, you're melanemic. It makes sense to me. People want, don't want to do it because those are three and four syllable words. And we are into the easier we can say it, the better we feel. Well, it's time for us to give up words that came up because it was easy to say, but it was a lie. And just this morning, I had a conversation with a group of college students and the professor was a psychologist and he said, um, how does this, how do you align this with psychology? This? And I said, wait a minute, I can't align it with psychology because I know what you're going to say. You're going to say something about social construct. We're going to say that the idea of race is a social construct. I said, let me tell you something. The idea of race isn't a social construct. Those are four syllables, so that's better. Social construct. The idea of race is a damn lie. It was a lie in the beginning, and it was a lie that has been, been, been perpetuated and perpetuated, grossly perpetuated, Christians. I'm a Christian, a practicing Christian. I'm going to keep on practicing until I get it right. I obviously don't have it right yet, but I'm working on it. But we, we in the name of God, kill people because of our ignorance about skin color and we got that ignorance. We are living with self-imposed ignorance because we don't bother to go and get a book and look it up. There, if you go to my website and just download the bibliography, if everybody would just download the bibliography from my website and read those books under racism, oh my God, you would never then hear a, an elementary teacher say about a child, oh, here comes another little black boy. She would say, here's another little brown boy whose skin is a little different from my own, but he's just gorgeous. Isn't he gorgeous? Isn't she gorgeous? Aren't all of these children simply beautiful? Because they're all members, boys and girls. Well, all of you who belong to this human race, please stand. And every kid will stand. Yeah, we all belong to the same race. That's right, boys and girls, you all belong to the same race. Now, if anybody tells you that you belong to a different race because your skin is a different color, you need to say to them, then if, if that person whose skin is a different color, if that's a member of a different race, then that person must have come from a different planet. What planet do you suppose that person came from? We've got to start telling elementary students when some teacher refers to somebody else's race, 
as as defined by the color of their as decided by the color of their skin. The kids have to say, well, 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 wait a minute, aren't we all members of the same race? And if we aren't members of the same race, where did that person come from? And when some teacher says, you're not a member of my race, the, the kid needs to say, and you're not gonna be my teacher anymore because I'm gonna tell my mother what you just said. And she's gonna come down on you like a duck on a June bug because there's only one race of people on the face of the earth and that's the human race. And we all came from the same place. Kids have to be taught that from birth, but instead in this country, they asked me to work with a group of midwives in, in uh, Los Angeles several years ago. And I said, why would you call me? I don't know anything about midwifery. I know how to deliver a baby because I've been delivered with four of them in five years. So I know about that, but I don't know about medicine. She said, the reason we want you to talk to us is because we know that women of color don't get the same treatment in the delivery room that white women do. And I thought, oh my God, do I want to hear this? I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to admit I knew that from birth to death, we are treated differently. But it never occurred to me that people who swear the Hippocratic Oath and go into medicine and go into a delivery room don't treat all women the same because of the ignorance of the person who's doing the delivery. What a horrible, horrible thing to have to worry about. What a horrible thing to have to think about. How horrible to have to go to a midwife to have your child delivered so that you're almost certain that that child and you will be treated fairly. This, this to me is, is proof of the ignorance, the self-imposed ignorance of people in this society who believe in several different races. Did I answer your question? This is a great, yes, absolutely. And this is a great setup for one of the audience questions that was sent to me. Uh, they asked if you could speak to the importance of acknowledging and embracing racial, they use the term racial diversity, along with your point around one human race. It sounds like the racial question diversity. around colorblind and, yeah. Racial, di racial diversity doesn't exist because there's only one race. They're calling it racial diversity because they have been programmed to think that there are, we have five different color, five different races in this country white, black, brown, yellow, and red. We do not have five different races. We're not talking about racial diversity here. We're talking about cultural diversity. We're talking about sexual diversity, gender diversity. We're talking about the lots and lots of diversity, but none of it is a result of different races. Racial diversity, when you use the word race, you are automatically indicating that you're ignorant about the topic. And if anybody says to me, well, we have allowed racial diversity in our school, I say, oh, really? How many of your kids came from another planet? Well, they all came from this planet. Then you don't have racial diversity. And you had not better be teaching about racial diversity when you don't know what you're talking about. Because there's only one race and we're all members of it. You can, color diversity is one thing, but you cannot justifiably treat people positively or negatively on the base of the color of their skin. That is no basis for how you treat people because what you're treating, how you treat them in that situation depends on how ignorant you are. Now, if you believe that those people who have that yellow colored skin are more intelligent than those of us who don't have it, that's because you have been brainwashed to believe that. In the first place, there are no yellow people. They are all, even those people that you call yellow are shades of brown. We've got to get over the, got, we've got to get into our heads the idea that we are all members of the same race and we are all come in shades of brown. Huh. Our president, whom I admire greatly because of what he has to go through, and it's going to get worse instead of better, several weeks ago signed legislation, yeah, making racial marriage legal. I went off, but I thought, my God, what has he done? How could you have And you can't get your hands on him, and you can't call him, and you can't get close to him when he comes to do a program in your community, you know, when he's campaigning. Somebody who he'll listen to has to go to him and say, you change that because you can't have a biracial marriage unless one of the people in that marriage is from outer space. You can't have a biracial marriage. There is no such thing. There's only one race of people on the face of the earth. And for you to sign legislation that makes biracial marriage legal 
is to indicate that you don't know what you're talking about. Am I right about that? Absolutely. And I think you're making another excellent point about the codification of these terms in legal forms that kind of set that precedent that we're like, oh, this is the words that we're supposed to use. And it becomes yeah. culturated. And yeah. so we struggle with, you know, expanding our vocabulary to ensure that we're being much more accurate rather than repeating past historical offenses meant to divide, divide and separate people. And the, but that is so important right now. And if you haven't read the book, The System by Robert Reich, get it and read it because he describes what happens in the business round table in the United States of America, that little bunch of wealthy males who tell the rest of us how we may live. It is absolutely infuriating. I should stop reading. I'd be better off if I would just stop reading. But then if I do that, I'll read the Bible where it says, thou shalt not kill. And then I have to look at what people are doing and what people have done to black people, what we call black people, to brown people, to yellow and red people, and to members of the LGBT, LGBTQ community. We, we, we preach out of that book and we absolutely break every one of the Ten Commandments on a daily basis. Now, this isn't, now somebody's going to say she's talking about religion. We shouldn't be talking about religion. Wait a minute. We justify our behaviors on the basis of our Christian religion all day, every day. Jesus must be just furious by what's happening. Because what's happening now in this country with the evangelical Christians is the most unchristian behavior I have ever seen. I ring. This is, it, it has gone on long enough now. People have to realize those, anybody who listens to this needs to go and get a $1 bill because you can afford to waste $1. And where it says, in God we trust, underneath it in really, really tiny print with a really, really tiny ballpoint pen, right? All others pay cash. Now, yeah. you see... If you trust, if you trust in God, really, you don't need money. And when I was a kid, I suppose I was 11 or 12 years old. I was coming out of the restaurant. My dad was taking me home from school. And I, there was this sign on the wall and it said, in God we trust. And underneath it, it said, all others pay cash. And I started to laugh. And my dad said, what are you laughing at? And I said, read that sign, dad. And he read it. He said, my God, that's right. And he laughed all the way to the car. And then he told people that every time I turned around, he was saying, and you know what it said, and you know what that means. And then here's our dollar bill and every piece of money in this country on it, it says, in God we trust. We have separation of church and state, except when it comes to our money. Make up your mind, people. Either you have separation of church and state or you don't have it. Now, which are you going to do? I think we have to take the words under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And when I was teaching third grade, I told my kids, if you don't want to say the words under God in the pledge, you don't have to. And you don't have to sit down where we're saying it. All you have to do is just leave it out. It never, they, those two words never belong in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Because even in that small town of Riceville, Iowa, I had people whose parents didn't believe in praying publicly. And the minute you put the words under God in the pledge, you've turned it into a prayer. So I would say to them, you don't have to say the words under God in the pledge. And I think the man, the basketball player, who refused to that whole long thing. I think it's time for us to get over using God to justify the ugly things that we're doing. And we can say we're doing this in the name of God. Well, God help us if we keep it up. Oh, very well I want to go back. I want to, well. Yeah, well, I want to go, well, I want to go back to the days of separation of church and state. I have been banned on most college and university campuses, along with Mark Twain, Alice Walker, Dostoevsky, and a whole bunch of other really fantastic thinkers. And I, and in that group, I'm highly complimented, but how dare they? And this week on television, you could see somebody with a blowtorch burning books. When that happened from 1933 till 1945, everybody was upset by it. Now, people are bringing the books, taking them out of the schools, taking them to what we can burn these books. If, if I were teaching today, and somebody came to my classroom, as they did when I was doing my student teaching in, in Independence, Iowa. My critic teacher was the principal of that elementary school. Her name was Hazel Grant. 
And that, that was at the time of the communist care. And a man came to her room and said, we're gonna go through your library and take out all the books that are about communism. And she said, go right ahead. So he came in and they came in and they took all the books off the shelves that they thought were communistic and piled them on top of the bookshelf. And they said, now we're done. And they did that in every room in that elementary building. Then she said, okay, thank you very much. And she led them to the door. She opened the door, she helped them out. She closed the door and she turned and said to us now, put those books back where they belong and let's go back to work. And that's what we did. We put the books back on the shelves and we back, went back to work. If I were teaching today and somebody came into my room and said, we're gonna take these books off the shelves, I'd say, wait a minute, whoa, wait a minute. Those books were purchased with taxpayer money. If you take those books, you are stealing from the taxpayers and you should be sued for doing that. I will turn you in for stealing from this room. Take those books, you can get away with taking them, but then you're going to have to pay the school, school district for the books that you're stealing. You think that would stop them? I think it would stop them. I think they'd think twice if there were enough teachers who would say, you take the books out of my room and I'm, a, I'm going to accuse you of thievery because those books were purchased by the money that came from the taxpayers in this county and they have the right to have their children see the books that their money bought. The only thing necessary for the continuation of evil is for good people to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the perpetuation of evil is for good people to do nothing. All you have to do to keep this book burning going on is just sit back and say, well, I can't do anything. I'm just one person. Well, let me tell you, Donald Trump is just one person. Jesus Christ was just one person. It's time for us to remember that one person can make a difference, but you won't make a difference if you just sit back and let somebody, it's somebody else's job. It is not somebody else's job, particularly if you're a teacher. I don't want to be called a teacher because I'm not one. I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix A-T-E, which means the act of, and the suffix O-R, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. And you can't do that if you allow your children to call one another white or black or red or yellow. It's time to get over that and start educating instead of indoctrinating. And in this country, we are teaching the same things today that they taught me when I went to a rural school from the age of five to the age of... 14, relating the same things today. They are learning the same things today that I learned then, and they were wrong. We've got to stop celebrating Columbus Day. Columbus wasn't the first person to discover these shores. The first people who discovered these shores came from Africa. For God's sake, if you haven't seen this copy of the National Geographic magazine, April of 2018, get it download this map and enlarge it and then have it laminated and then hang it on the wall because it shows where we all came from and how in two waves those brilliant people managed to populate every landmass on the face of the earth those brilliant people that whose descendants we have de described as not knowing as being ignorant as being uneducated they had the brilliance and the energy and the creativity and the curiosity to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Instead of Columbus Day, we should be celebrating Afro-American Day because that's what every one of us are. We are all descendants of African-Americans. Nobody wants to hear that. And I understand why they don't want to hear that because that takes away the rightness of whiteness. Well, there ain't no such thing as whiteness. And what I say to a group of young males of who are melanaceous and melanotic they say well well we've just gotten the people to recognize the goodness of being black and i say how nice of them but you are black so now you've got to take the next step up into becoming an adult and admit that you don't have to depend on the word black that you are a shade of brown just like i am just like everybody in this building is everybody on this in this state in this country is a shade of brown we are all shades of brown refuse to be described as they describe people they wanted to kill during the Spanish Inquisition. Because if you keep on using that terminology, then you keep on doing what they did. If it's all right to call them those colors, 
then it's all right to do what we did to them and what we are still doing to them. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that really underscores one of the things that us as uh, conscious communicators strive to understand in our daily work, which is language leads to behavior, which is what the point Absolutely. you just made there. Words are the most powerful weapon devised by humankind. We use words to destroy people all day, every day. And we, for the most part, don't even realize what we're doing because we have been destroyed by those words all our lives. We know that as long as we go along, we won't be othered. I have been othered since birth because my mother wanted a boy and I was a girl and she was angry from that time till the day she died. I know how it feels to be othered. I also know how to stop the othering. We've got to stop making people the others and make them all members of the same race. All of you and all of anybody who's listening to this, if there is still anyone listening, are my 30th to 50th cousins because our ancestors all came from the same place. So you are one of my cousins. If you don't want to be, you have my sympathy, but that's all you'll get. You can't, you can't deny the fact that we are all members of the same race. We all came from the same place and different faces are not different races. We're all members of the shades of brown color group. Okay, what's your next question? Which I probably already right. asked. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, some of it you have, but I, I want to go a little deeper on the language thing. I was doing uh, uh, some more research on you. I've, I've been following your work for decades, but... One, one thing that you did uh, in the last five years or so was you were at the University of Houston and you were at the School of uh, Sociology, I believe, which is the same uh, school that Brene Brown comes out of. But you were sitting next to Angela Davis. And here I'm going <laughs> to quote something that you said in that conversation. You said, we have to get rid of the language of racism. Words are important. Words matter. You have to be careful how you use them and, and you have to refuse to tolerate these ugly words from being used in your presence. So we as communicators and organizations, we set the tone for language. And as I mentioned, we believe language leads to behavior. Can you speak more to words and how they've been weaponized and what we can do about it to change it? We, we use words to keep people in their place. We were to keep some people down and to keep some people up. You know that, and so do I. Words are what got Donald Trump elected to the presidency. Words used to inflame and arouse people against one another. And if you can keep people angry at the Jews, and if you can keep people suspicious of those black people, and if you can keep people convinced that it, the people who are what we call red came if you can believe in Turtle Island, if you can keep, can be, have people believe things like Turtle Island, then you can keep people in their place. And if you, if you have the skills, and it's not too hard to have those skills, if you are living, living in a society in which most of the members of that society are screen addicted. And in our society right now, if it doesn't come off the screen, if you can't see it on your cell phone, then it isn't true. And if you do see it on your cell phone and you choose your right, the right channel, you'll get only the things you want to see and only the things you want to hear on that cell phone and on that television so that you will only hear what you want to believe. And that has been the major instrument that demagogues have used in this country for the last 20 years. We have brainwashed the, the, the communities in the United States of America by telling them this is, this is true because it's here on the net. If it's on the net, it must be true. Hopefully, now the man who owned that one cha channel, channel, Murdoch, is probably, maybe that channel yeah. will change its behavior now. I hope so, but that has been an extremely destructive situation. That person and the people he hired and the people who read the news on that channel have been extremely destructive. There are a couple of others that are. We've got to take, teach children. Look, if somebody says something that is obviously way out, then you go to a book, go to the library, get a magazine, get something and look it up. 
get the dictionary. Look up the word race and you'll find out it came out as a meaning for a specific group of people in 1580. If you just look up some of these words that you're hearing and see how ridiculous it is to use those words in that phrase and in that context, then you'll say to yourself, wait a minute, maybe the rest of what they're saying isn't true either. We've got to teach children of all ages. And I mean of all ages. I know friends who, of mine who graduated from high school with me who still believe the crap about Christopher Columbus. I think it's perfectly all right to call those brown-skinned people Indians <laughs> and just go along to get along because that's what they told us in school. Well, they lied to you. They didn't know what they were talking about. But now we know, we know the difference. And it's time for us to go back and say, wait a minute, that isn't the way it was. Here's the way it really was. Here, here, it, look at this book says this is the way it really was. And then somebody will say, how do you know if that's right? And you say, wait a minute, take a look at the, a man who's written a book about me. It's called uh, Shades of Brown. And I thought, this is taking too long. You know, I could write this book in 20 minutes because there's all that, that's all there is to me. And then I read his book and he has everything that he says in there is in the back of the book. It tells you exactly where that came from and what that means and what that was for. It's like, oh my God, I didn't even think of it that way. Kids have to be taught to go to the appendix. They have to be taught to the go to the glossary. They have to be taught to use that dictionary. They have to be taught to use that thesaurus. Kids ought to be told, look people, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put this Pantone color wheel up on the wall. The Pantone color wheel has all shades of brown on it. It's a skinned, skin Pantone color wheel. Now you go up and put your palm against that color wheel and run your hand around that color wheel until you come to a color that matches the skin on your back of your hand. Then you go to the thesaurus and look up all the synonyms for brown. There are about a hundred synonyms for brown in the big thesaurus. You pick out one that you think matches this color on the back of your hand. Then you take that word to the dictionary and read the definition of that word and it'll tell you what color it is. And if that matches the color of your skin, then for the rest of your life, when somebody wants to know the color of your skin, that's the one you'll use. A couple of young melanaceous women called me a couple of years ago, oh, probably a year ago, and said, from now on, when we have to fill in a form and say, ask our race, we're gonna put human. I said, what are you gonna put if it asks for skin color? One of them said, I'm gonna put mocha. The other one said, I'm putting chocolate. And I said, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Because her color, her skin color is mocha. Her other skin color, the other skin color is chocolate. That makes perfectly good sense to me. I'd have to put spotted because I am spotted. There's no doubt about it. But we, we need to deal with reality. A black kid is told he's black and then he tries to find something black that matches him. He can't do it. It isn't on the Pantone color wheel. There is no white Pantone uh, on, the, on the Pantone color wheel and there's no black one. They're just shades of brown. Everybody needs to see that Pantone color wheel. You can buy it at one of your local stores. Put it on the wall, have the kids identify their own skin color. They won't find a white thing on that and they won't find a black one. If we could just get everybody convinced that we are all members of the same race, <laughs> we've got to give up, I hate to say this, but we've got to give up the golden rule that says do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I think it was when I was on with, with on that, that thing. I said, well, everybody, white person in this room that wants to be treated the way we treat our people of color, please stand. Nobody stood. We do not do unto others as we would have others do unto us. We do unto others as we choose to do unto others. I don't believe in the golden rule. I believe in the platinum rule, which says do unto others as others would have you do unto them. And in order for me to find out how somebody else wants to be treated, I don't go up to the nearest person and say, how, pe how do people like you want to be treated? I go to a book and I read as many books as I can to learn about those who are different from me because everybody's different in some way, but we are all alike in one way, which is we are all members of the same race. And that likeness is more important than all those differences. Make no mistake about that. We are all members of the same race. And if, if we can get children to read and read the truth and enjoy the truth and respect the truth, then we could deal with, <laughs> CD, is it CRT, right? Right now, the really conservative yes, folks are angry about theory. CRT. CRT, oh my mm -hmm. God, critical race theory. 
Critical number one. Race, which doesn't exist. Theory, it's another damned idea. Instead of critical race theory, for me, CRT stands for Curriculum Respecting Truth. CRT, Curriculum Respecting Truth. And if you tell the truth, you don't have to worry about critical race theory because you are going to talk about several different races. And this isn't a theory. This is fact. We are all members of the same race. That's the only thing you need to know about race, unless you're talking about a physical contact, contest. You want to talk about a physical contest, then that's a race. Sure, fine. But when you talk about a race and you're talking about people, you've got to talk all about the same one because we are all members of the same race. They are really trying to teach children, teach a curriculum that tells the truth to all children about the fact that there's only one race. Does that make sense to you? You know, yeah, yes. And we, that actually ties into one of the audience questions that came in. What the person is interested in knowing is they would love to know your thoughts about this weaponization of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, CRT, as you mentioned, but also the Supreme Court rulings around affirmative action and college admissions. Well, the people in the United States who voted for Donald Trump asked for that to happen to the Supreme Court because they didn't pay enough attention. That man has been the worst thing that has happened in my lifetime to the United States of America. And he intends to keep on being the worst thing that could happen to this country. It is absolutely ridiculous to talk about critical race theory without talking about the attempt to tell the truth in history in this country. We have to start telling the truth because if we don't, eventually these kids are gonna get old enough and smart enough to say, as I did to my dad one day, you know, dad, you're wrong about that. He didn't kick me out of the family. All he said was, if you don't want to agree with what I am, if you don't like the way I think, the road's not crowded. He didn't say get out. He said the road's not crowded. And I knew at that point that I better not disagree with my dad about what he had been taught to believe because he was an extremely moral man. By the time he died, I showed him the video that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation did in my classroom the first time it was recorded. He had come into my classroom and, and you know, filmed my third graders going through that exercise. They sent me a copy of that, and I took that up to the hotel that my parents, that I owned and my parents lived in, and I showed it to just my dad and my mother. And he was probably 59 or 60 years old at the time. He'd been a farmer all his life. And after it was over, that man stood up. He took his red handkerchief out of the back pocket of his bib overalls. He blew his nose. He wiped his eyes, and he said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. I have never forgotten that, and I never will. And any time a psychologist says to me, look at the awful thing you did to those children, I say, wait a minute. Here's what my father said at the age of about 60. After having raised six kids and lost one, his favorite died. But he still had those other six. He stood up and he said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. He was right. He should have been taught that when he was nine years old. He would never have told us, I don't want any picking any coming into my house as grandchildren. And then I brought my Saudi Arabian son-in-law and my daughter's little half Saudi Arabian grandchild into my dad's house. And I put that grand, great grandchild of his in his arms and he looked at it and he said, that's the most beautiful baby I've ever seen. And then he looked up at those two people standing there, one Anglo-American and one Saudi Arabian. And he said, that's a good cross. My dad was a farmer and he knew what a good cross is. He knew that there are breeds that you cross and there are breeds that you don't cross. And he looked up close to, I'll never forget, he said, that's a good cross. It was absolutely a whole lifetime that he had to question and then say, I've been wrong. And admit it out loud to all of us. And I, you know, we all just broke up because good Lord, here was the man that we had all, th we thought, and I know to this day, he's the most moral man I've ever known the most honest man I've ever known. He, he just, he said to us, get an education, what you put in your head, they can't take away from you. So we all went to college mm -hmm. because he said, get an education. Because what you, and, and he was right. But unfortunately for the world, if you educate somebody, really educate them and lead them out of ignorance, then you can't just lead them around by the nose anymore. And that's the reason it's extremely important that we keep on encouraging people 
to go to college. But then we also have to encourage college educators to be educators and not just same old, same old. If we can get some real education into people, we can change the world. There's not a doubt in my mind of what education is the answer to every problem you will ever find. But if you don't know, you let it go. So we've got to see that these kids know the truth. We've got to, we've got to do CRT. We've got to do curriculum respecting truth. And I said to the teachers, look, I teach the three R's. And this one teacher said, well, we all teach the three R's. I said, what three R's do you teach? Reading, writing, arithmetic. I said, well, think about that. Only one of those words begins with R. Writing begins with W and arithmetic begins with A. Now, do you want to hear the real three R's? She said, well, go ahead. And I said, yeah. Rights, respect, and responsibility. You must respect the rights of every student, every janitor, every secretary, every administrator, every other teacher, every coach in that building. And if you do not respect the rights of every one of them, I will hold you responsible. And that's what we have to teach in this country instead of the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic. We have to teach the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility. Hazel Grant taught me, without even knowing that she was doing it, how to use cooperative competition in a classroom. It's absolutely beautiful. My kids learned and took care of themselves. I didn't have to do any discipline because we had a point system. And if you did the right thing, you had the point. If you did the wrong thing, you took off a point. And then everybody in your role was furious. So then you did whatever you could to get that point back. And at the end of the week, the people who had the most points in their role got into the grab bag, which is just cheap little stuff that third graders love. I did the same thing at the junior high level. And it worked every time. Those kids learned to take care of themselves and to take care of one another. And we've got to teach children to take care of themselves and to take care of one another. Because when you get to be my age, you're going to realize how absolutely essential it is that people who are younger than you have learned how to take care of others. You don't have a choice. At, at my age, you have no choice. You've got to depend on those who are younger than you are. But if you have taught them that getting old is a crime and taking care of somebody else isn't your, isn't your, isn't your job, and they should take care of themselves, then you've created another problem for the people who get over 65. Okay, did I answer your question yes. about critical race theory? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, never, absolutely. Never, yeah, never, never, yeah, never, never re refer to that as critical race theory again. Refer to that as curriculum respecting truth. And then nobody can criticize you for it because all you have to do is say, well, you've got the wrong words there. This isn't critical race theory. This is curriculum respecting truth. And if you do that, then you'll stop celebrating Columbus Day and you'll start celebrating African-American Day because African-Americans were here 15,000 years before the birth of Jesus, before the birth of Christopher Columbus. 15,000 years. Terrifying. And we celebrate Columbus, who was lost, had a lousy navigator, thought he had reached India, called the people who were here Indians, when in fact the people who met were Arawaks. Arawak village was the one that he had invaded and that he, he stole a couple of those Arawaks and took them back and showed them to the Pope. And the Pope said, these peoples aren't, these two, these folks aren't Christian, therefore they must not be human. They kept them in Columbus land and Christianized them. Two or three years later, they took them back and showed them to the Pope and he said, oh, these people have become Christianized, therefore they must be human. And he granted human status to the natives of this continent after he Christianized them. Does that make any sense to you? Hell no, but it did to the Pope. And see, that isn't the kind of thing you tell in school either. Kids ought to hear that story. They ought to realize that in order for those people to survive in Columbus's land, they had to be Christian. And in order to survive during the Spanish Inquisition, you had to be Christian. And even if you were Christian, and but you didn't look like you might be Christian, they killed you in order to turn you into a Catholic. This whole thing began with religion. It's terrifying. It was, it's an absolute opposition to what Jesus taught us, and we ought to change our ways. But instead, we're going to put prayer back into the schools because of Donald Trump and his followers. They're insisting that we put prayer back in the schools and that we ban all these books and that we ban teachers who, in, who intend to go on using these books. Prayer does not belong in the school. Make no mistake about that. 
I, I agree with you. I, and I grew up as a conservative Christian and I completely agree with you. And I want to tie into scary. something. Go ahead. I agree. I agree. And that there could be a whole section where we could talk about that and as a, like a bonus conversation. I want to tie into um, you, what we were just, what you were just sharing and also highlighting how my mentor is a black woman out of Los Angeles and she, no, no, she is not, she is not, years. she is, she is not a black woman. <laughs> she, is, she, she is a melanation. See, woman. you're right. Melanation you're right. See, I did it. Woman. I did it. I knew I was going to mess up at some point. <laughs> and you are wearing a shirt that's white and it doesn't match your skin. So your skin isn't white. You, you're right, Jane. Thank you for busting me. Thank you for interrupting my unconscious bias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So she and I were talking about how the people who are leading the indictments against Trump, she had mentioned in the four, they're either led by melanaceous women and a judge who is a melanaceous man. And I was saying, these are the people that are out there. <laughs> They're the ones leading this work. And you, uh, just a few years ago, were on Red Table Talk with uh, Jada Pinkett yeah. Smith. And that topic of that particular episode was talking about the relationship between so-called uh, white women and so-called black women and that relationship there. And um, I would love for you to talk about how, then this relates to what I was just saying is like, as, as a melanemic person, uh, seeing, you know, seeing these folks leading the indictments and putting themselves out there who are amongst the most vulnerable in this country. And like, you know, how do we support, how do we become advocates and, you know, go beyond allyship and getting involved and support, et cetera, in our own way, but also in a, in a more visible way. But this relates to the relationship topic that the Red Table was talking about in that episode that you were a part of is like, what does, what does it look like to bring our relationships more closer together in a meaningful way to repair the hurt and the pain that melanemic women have done in the feminism movement, the suffrage movement, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where we can repair these relationships and become more of a formidable uh, force in creating the change that we need to see. But that's one of the main things that people who are melanemic males are afraid of. They are scared to death. They know that they are going to lose their numerical majority in the United States of America within 25 years. Within tw it was 30 years a couple of years ago. Within 25 years, melanemic people will become a numerical minority in the United States of America. And they're scared to death that melanemic, melanaceous and melanotic people think we believe in the golden rule and we treat people the way we want to be treated. Now, we don't believe in the golden rule, and we don't treat people the way we want to be treated. We treat people the way we think they deserve. If we really believed in the golden rule, we would be treating people in a very, very different way. If we really treated people the way we want to be treated, we would be treating everybody absolutely beautifully, because that's the way we want to be treated. I just think it's so amazing to watch television today. And when I was a kid, when, when I was, what, 15, 18, we got our first television set. And there was Walter Cronkite, and there was Dan Rather, maybe, or people like that. All these big pink men told us everything we needed to know about everything. And when you did a, a Oxidol commercial or a, a floor cleaning commercial, some male voice came out of the wall and told the woman what to use to clean her house and to flush down her stool. There's always some obviously white male voice came out of the wall. We were taught by television for years that if you wanted the truth and if you wanted power, then you acted like, you talked like, you walked like, you dressed like a white male. That was, a, that, was the, that was the lesson that people of all kinds got. If you want to be famous, all you have to be is white and male. 
And if you're estranged, maybe they'll allow you as a female to join the group. But if you are a person of color, no, no, that we can't have that because we want our viewers to see the world the way we want them to see it and the way we want it to be. So white males did everything. According to our social studies books, white males did all the in inventing, all the, all the discovering, all of it was done by white males. And then you get to be my age or you get five years younger than I am now, and you read the book, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. And you think, oh my God, what have we done? And all of a sudden you realize that all the things that white males claim to have been responsible for came to us from countries in Africa, from brilliant, melanaceous and melanotic women. You see the latest addition to the Supreme Court in the United States of America. And it's this brilliant, melanotic woman. And she's sitting there while these tall, white, pale, stale males are directing these ugly questions at her. And she looks at them. And they ask this really, really repulsive question, and she answers it very calmly. She doesn't take any notes. She doesn't read any notes. She doesn't refer to a book. She doesn't refer to a paper. She answers their questions very calmly, and then she takes another drink of water and waits for the next ignorant question to be asked. You can't watch that without developing tremendous, tremendous respect for the woman who went through that, and tremendous disrespect, disrespect for the men who did it to her and who are running this country today. There is hope in this, in that, in the future, this country will not be run by all melanemic males. It will be run by, and we will get our news from, something that does someone who doesn't look like you and who doesn't look like me, but who looks like the first people who came to this continent. We've got to stop seeing skin color as an indicator of intelligence or worth as a human being. We've got to see that skin color is simply our body's adaptation to the natural environment. It has nothing to do with being God's chosen children. And don't, <laughs> I should never talk about these things. They get really upset. Right now, Mr. Joe Biden is continuing the wall on the southern border of the United States. They're now building it higher and longer. Donald Trump said, we've got to put a wall along the southern border of the United States because we don't want those brown-skinned people coming in here because brown-skinned people reproduce too rapidly. I wonder if Joe Biden realizes that the reason the thing he's doing is being done because some people are afraid to have too many brown-skinned people in their environment. I wonder if he realizes that he's a brown-skinned person. He doesn't. He thinks racially. We've got to get over the idea of race. We've got to get over the idea of thinking of people as members of different races. I don't remember what your question was, but I am upset by the fact that we are still doing today what we did when I was 13. It's, we're still doing the things and teaching the things and saying the things and believing the things that we did 74 years ago. And look at all that has happened between then and now. For the love of God, how do we justify still using the vocabulary that we used 75 years ago today? It, I, I see that never occurred to me. It never occurred to me. Oh my God, that's exactly what we're doing. Our, our entertainment isn't the same. Our music isn't the same. Nothing is the same. Everything has changed supposedly for the better, except one thing. Racism hasn't changed except in the last six years to get worse. So here we have all these wonderful inventions, these wonderful strides forward for civilization, and we're still right back in the 1500s where how we see and treat people of other colors is, com is concerned. You see something wrong with this? Yes. It's this continual narrative that is overshadowing and controlling behavior to keep us separate so we aren't unified and we don't have each other's backs. And that was the origination of my question of how to especially women of shades, skin color shades, unify and, and be more supportive 
with this really harmful, traumatic, horrible past? And, and how do we repair and be able to unify moving that, forward? That's what we have to do. We have to get in groups of women, even those who don't think the way you think they should, and sit down and read books like The Color of the, you know, uh, Shades of Brown or The Myth of Race or Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization or Beyond Racism by Whitney Young or The Color of Law. Oh my God, if you read The Color of Law, you're just furious. Or White Angel yeah. Evangelical Racism. Yes. Go to my go to my website. Download the printed learning materials. The first is a set of typical statements that women make that think they aren't racist. They'll say things. People will say things to me like, "When I see people, I don't see people as black or white or red or brown. I just see people as people." And then I have to say, well, "Wait a minute. <laughs> What's wrong with seeing people as Absolutely. black or white or red or brown? What's wrong with seeing skin color? You're ju you've just made a racist statement." But you go to that website and you download the typical statements. Read the first one and then download the clarifications. And it'll tell you what you, how the person who heard you say that uh, interpreted what you said for each one of those. I think there are 20 or 25. I don't remember. I haven't used it for a while. First is the typical statements. Then is the clarification to those statements. And then is a set of commitments to combat racism. I think there are 18 things you can do in your own environment to deal with your own racism. Because racism isn't just out there. Racism is within us because we have lived in a racist society for entire lives. No matter how old you are, you have lived in a racist society because that's what this country is. It is a racist society. And the reason it's a racist society is because racism is an extremely lucrative endeavor. We make huge amounts of money off racism. And if you don't believe that, you go to the nearest prison and you see how many men who are melanaceous and melanotic are locked up in that prison because of something that they wouldn't have been sent to prison for if they had been melanemic. And we are using their bodies. Corporations send products into that into prisons to be made into the products they want to sell. They send in the materials that will be used to make these products, and they pay those people. They don't pay them even $4 an hour. And their money goes to the victim of their crime. Oftentimes, the men who are in there who are melanaceous and melanotic are involved in a crime in which there was no victim, in which the victim was the person who committed what they call a crime. That's the same, for instance, oh my God. You just, you watch television this week and you hear about the fact that the former president is being tried for 19, is it 19? or 91 separate crimes. And we are using oh, taxpayer yeah, it's, money. It's like 91. Mm -hmm. it's, it's ungodly. And he is being tried for all those crimes. If he were black, what we call black, he'd have been in prison for the first one. And we have been supporting him for the rest of his life. But he's the right color, the right color. He has gotten away with things that were absolutely unacceptable illegal, inhumane, and unchristian. And you cannot prove your Christianity by holding the Bible up upside down. That ain't gonna do. It doesn't do it. We just, we allow people who have the right color to do things that would never be acceptable if a person of a different color group did them. You know that, and I know that. And the police know that, and the law enforcement people know that. And the judges know that. And if you read the book, The Color of Law, all of a sudden it, oh, it all comes, it just falls into place. Of course, that's the reason this happened. There are two pages in that book. I think page 216 and 217, maybe. It's a list of all the things that wouldn't have happened the way they, had, the way they did if we hadn't been judging people by skin color. And, our, and it isn't, we aren't judging them by skin color. We're judging them because of our ignorance about skin color and what it means. When some woman or some man or some kid will say to me, they don't like me because of the color of my skin. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not because of the color of your skin. Get, the, get over that. The first modern human beings that evolved on this earth look like you. They don't look like me. They look like you. If they hadn't, they couldn't have lived. Where they came from, they couldn't have. The sun would have killed them. But they look like you, not like me. 
that reason that person doesn't like you isn't because of the color of your skin. It's because of his ignorance about skin color. You can't change the color of your skin. He can change his level of ignorance. And that's what he needs to do. And that's what teachers need to do. They need to teach children that skin color is not God given. It is a result of your body's adaptation to the natural environment over centuries. You have a right to be what you are, but you do not have the right to be an educator who fails to tell that to children. Educators have to tell people of all, all ages, all grade letters, race, skin color isn't the problem. Self-imposed ignorance is the problem. And it isn't stupid because you can't fix stupid. You can fix ignorance. You fix it with education. And you expect children, here's a book about what you've just said. Read this book and I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. Read it tonight when you go home. Instead of turning on television, read this book. When I was teaching third grade, we had a kids call a kids club. Kids Club, K-I-I-D-S, Kids Interested in Doing Something. And they were required by me to watch to not watch more than an hour of television every night after school. After school, they had to be involved in doing something else except for Friday night and Saturday night. The rest of the nights of the week, they had to do something other than watch television. They could watch one hour. And one, one of the teacher's aides said to me, Jane, you're just not being fair to those children. I said, what do you mean? Those children need to be with their parents, and that's where they are when they're watching television. That's bullshit. They aren't with their parents when they're watching television. They're inside that idiot box. Well, Jane, I just think it's awful for you to take your children, these children, away from their parents. Say, Fine, Sue, I understand. Then I moved up to junior high, and I got her children, in my liter her child in my literature class, her son. And she came to me, oh, about four weeks into the period and said, Jane, I'm so pleased with what Neil's doing. I said, what's Neil doing? I never see him without a book in his hand. He's reading all the time. And I didn't say, you silly woman, don't you remember what you said to me five years ago? I didn't say that. I said, well, I'm just tickled to death. I'm really pleased that he's reading. And to this day, Neil reads. He is a determined reader. Because somebody said to him at the seventh grade level, here's what you're going to do if you're in my class. You're going to read. Because reading is fundamental. Reading can, reading can take you from a position of ignorance to a position of knowledge. Okay, friends, we're actually going to pause the conversation right here. I know it is so good, and it was really building up momentum. You probably hate me right now, but the conversation when we, we recorded was so good. We just kept going and going. So we're going to split it in the sake of your time and protecting your time. We're going to split this conversation into two different episodes. So keep a lookout and find the other half and the other part of this conversation with this guest. I know you're going to love it. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. And until next time, Let's keep taking care of each other.